Hello, media and popular culture students, and welcome to our fifth week lecture. Uh, and this week we will be looking at uh, Douglas Kellner's Cultural Studies, Multiculturalism, and Media Culture. So to get started, I just want to review a, a little bit of the history that we've already sort of discussed, but I want to give it to you in kind of a timeline here. So you'll remember that we started off talking about how, uh, you know, McLuhan, for example, was kind of a response to what was known as uh, media effects studies. So when MassCom first started, uh, you know, as an academic discipline back in the late 40s, early 50s, we were concerned largely with the Second World War and in particular people were trying to answer the question. It's the same kind of question that Adorno and Horkheimer were trying to answer, by the way. But we we're trying to figure out how Germany, uh, one of the greatest cultures in, in the history of Western civilization, had sort of fallen into uh, Nazi barbarism. You know, how did, how did the, the culture of, of, of Beethoven and, and Goethe end up, you know, with this crazed madman leading them and, and, you know, the massacre of 13 million people? And so one of the things that people pointed the finger at was, of course, their use of mass media. Uh, you know, Hitler and his propagandists were quite good at, at making use of, of mass media and the radio in particular and used it to, to advance their cause. And so, you know, in, in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, in countries like the U.S., you know, people were asking this question, how'd they get there, you know? And, and so we began to, to study media in an attempt to try and kind of figure out what it does to people, right? And, and so this all operates on, on what we call kind of a, a reductionist uh, notion, right? So reductionist is a fancy term for, for saying, you know, it's oversimplified. Uh, but, you know, the reductionist idea behind media effects studies are that people watch a piece of media, they, they get the message, and then because they watched or listened to or read this, this piece of media, right, uh, they go out then and, and do something. So, I mean, you're probably all familiar with this argument and have heard various iterations of it, and because media, media effects kinds of arguments are still around today. You don't see them as often in, in colleges and in the academy, but you certainly see these kinds of arguments in the news. So, uh, you know, the idea goes, uh, well, this kid played, uh, you know, GTA V, and that's a violent video game, and so that's why he went out and shot up his school. Or, uh, you know, this kid watched a violent movie, and that's why he beat up the kids on the playground kind of thing. Um, or, for that matter, this grown man had pornography in his house, and that's what turned him into a rapist, right? I mean, these are the kinds of media effects, uh, reductionist arguments that, that we now pretty much reject, right? But nevertheless, uh, you know, given the, the, the impact of the Second World War and everything that happened, it's no wonder that people were concerned with the idea of what the media can do to people. But in any event, we've, we've come away since then, and, and so... You know, we kind of moved away from media effects studies and we moved towards what's called ideological criticism, right? And an example of this ideological criticism could be found in the Adorno and Horkheimer uh, culture industry article that we read, the Walter Benjamin uh, work of art in the age of its mechanical re reproducibility article. And, and these philosophers, of course, are scholars, are, are neo-Marxist scholars. So they're looking for ideology, you know, in everything and trying to you know, trying to argue that the media is a form of social control and that the, the rich and the, the powerful use it to stay rich and powerful. And so they're always looking for for the power dynamics, right? The, the dominance hierarchies in, the, in a society and then the messages in our media that might help uh, perpetuate these kinds of, of hierarchies. So we, we sort of move from there then on into the uh, what's known as British Cultural Studies. Uh, this was developed at the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, or the BCCCS. And these folks, uh, well, Stuart Hall was a member of the BCCCS, right? That's hard to say. There's too many C's in there. But he was a member of the Birmingham School. 
and and they were you know more open to to the idea of looking at uh, media as a cultural production and thinking about it in terms of you know a larger circuit. So you'll remember in in the encoding decoding article, uh, you know Stuart Hall talks about production, uh, distribution. Uh, reception, and then feedback, right? And so that's kind of a mini circuit of culture. So it operates as kind of a circle, you know, like they make something and then, then it's distributed, it's put out, and then people watch it, and then people provide feedback, and that influences the next thing that's made, and then that goes out, and then people watch that, and then they provide feedback, you see, and it's, and it's all, you know, kind of a circle, or a cycle. And so, you know, all this together, all these different sort of ideas together, this evolution from one to the other to the other, eventually lead us to where we're at now, which is contemporary cultural studies. And that's what Kellner is doing. The Kellner piece that I ask you to read for this week is an example, although it's an early example, is, is an example that's much closer to the kind of study of culture that we do today and is indeed sort of a canonical piece of, of contemporary cultural studies, right? And cultural studies, in a way, combines a little bit of all the things that came before it, right? I mean, so the people who practice cultural studies now, which is a real field of study, right? There are people with their PhD in cultural studies. It's something you can get a degree in at a lot of universities. Uh, people who, who, who do contemporary cultural studies today borrow what they think are the best of all these schools that came before, right? It's, they're sort of uh, like academic poachers, picking, picking the best. And so they do this in an effort to, to sort of look at what came before, critique it, and then try and, try and answer some questions, right? And so the questions, and these are similar to the questions I'm going to ask you now, one of which, the first one, we already kind of know, right? What's the problem with the media effects approach or the hypodermic needle approach? This idea that, you know, media functions like a hypodermic needle and somebody watches something, it's like getting an injection and, and the idea goes straight into their mind and then they go out and act on it, right? Well, we know, we know what the problem with that is. And the problem with that is, is sort of what McLuhan pointed out, right? Like it's, Media doesn't work that way. It's the same thing that Hall points out in the encoding decoding article, which is that we all know that we don't have to, you know, accept a message that someone sends us. You know, I might watch a politician on TV and say, oh, yeah, I agree with that, in which case it's working the way they want it to work. But I also might watch that message and say, oh, that's nonsense, you know, and, and reject it. So that's kind of the problem with that approach. Now, there's also a problem with the kind of ideological criticism that, you know, Adorno and Horkheimer were doing. And that is in part that because they're neo-Marxists, they're, they're so interested in power, you know, and in power relations, that they, they ignore the fact that not every relationship in the world is based on power relations, right? I, I mean, certainly power and, and inequities of power are important, but it's not everything, Right, And even beyond that, we, we have to realize that if we look at a text and just look for the messages that help the ruling class, we're ignoring a whole bunch of other factors, like you know, how it was made and how people actually think of it you know, once they see that product. Or you know, like if we're talking about a TV show, I could do a, an Adorno and Horkheimer style critique of it right, and, and look for ideological messages. But when I do that, I'm ignoring you know, what were the conditions it was made under. Who paid for it? What were their motivations? Under what circumstances? During what time period? And then how did people react to it? Did they agree with the message? Did they disagree with the message? Right? So, you know, that's one of the problems with ideological, ideological criticism. So then the question, right, that the modern cultural studies people ask themselves is how do you correct for these problems? Right? So that's one of the questions they ask. The other one is what's the role of media in society? What does it do? What should it do, right? I mean, these might not even be the same thing. And then how important is media literacy? I mean, isn't it important to educate people? You know, at one point when the, after the printing press, you know, and uh, the, during the Protestant Reformation, when Bibles were going out to all different kinds of folks across Europe, and people were reading the Bible, you know, for themselves for the first time, you know, that's where we really started talking about a literate populace, you know, a literate population and wanting people to be able to read books, 
But I mean, isn't it just as important in today's world that people are able to read the media, right? To think critically about the messages that they're getting, particularly in an era where the press, the, the news is so partisan, so one-sided on, on, on each side, right? And then when we talk about media literacy, I mean, even that has its, has its you know, bad implications because, you know, the crazy people, Right, the like the QAnon people are the first ones to tell you, oh well, you got to be media literate. You know, you got to got to do your research so that you know that the Democrats are, you know, uh, pedophiles and eating babies. Right, um, so we got to be, you know, it's important to be truly media literate. But then we got to ask the question, what does that even mean? In you know, can it even be obtained? Let's say, can we can we really look at media the right way in a world where you know it seems like everyone in the media is got a got an agenda so you know the answer is how do, how do you go about answering all these questions so thankfully we have Douglas Kellner and he gives us some ideas so Doug Kellner is a third generation critical theorist and and a lot of his thinking you know he's most heavily influenced by the Frankfurt School and the Frankfurt School are people like Adorno and Horkheimer and Benjamin but that's not to say that that he's doing the same kind of work he's doing He's inspired by them, but he also takes into account these other, you know, Stuart Hall and so on. And so he's an early theorist in the field of critical media literacy, right? And and he's a he's one of the the top guys in media in the in the study of media culture more more generally. So he begins his piece with an exploration of of you know what media does. And so he's trying to answer this question: you know, what's the role of media in society? Excuse me. So he looks at it, and he comes up with an answer, and he puts it right there out front, and he says, what the media does is it provides the materials that we use to make our identities, right? The media gives us a sense of who we are as selves, uh, gives us a notion of what it means to be male or female, gives us a sense of our, our social class, uh, of our ethnicity, of our race, of our nationality, of our sexuality, an idea of us versus them, Right? It does all of this. It shapes our view of the world. It, indeed, the media, he says, shapes our deepest values. Gives us ideas of good or bad, positive or negative, moral or evil, right? Now, of course, some of you um, might say, well, you know, my, my parents give me... And of course, you know, parents do give us ideas of all these things, but, but we can't undercut the importance of the media, you know. I can remember, and I'm literally not kidding about this, much of my idea of good and evil came from Star Wars as a young child, right? Like, I'm a 50-year-old man. Star Wars played a big role in my childhood, right? And a lot of my thinking about good and bad came from Star Wars, right? Of good and evil. It came from the characters I saw on TV and how they acted and how they treated other people, you know? Um, now, of course, at one time in American culture and, and Western culture more generally, the church did much of this. Uh, I don't, you know, as America has become increasingly secular and moved away from religion, I would suggest to you that the media has taken on a lot of this role, right? Um, he goes on and he says it provides the symbols, myths, and resources through which we constitute a common culture. So, you know, what, what he's saying here is that it binds us together, right? It's, well, it's like the Force in Star Wars. It binds us together. And, of course, this, this isn't so much the case anymore, but it certainly was when, when Kellner wrote this, you know. When there were three channels on TV, uh, everybody was pretty much watching one of three things. And then the next day, we could go in and all talk about it together. And there were stories about the TV shows in the newspapers and in the TV guide. And, and we all watched the same stuff, and so as a result, it gave us all something to talk about. You know, when man walked on the moon, that's all you could see on TV. Every channel covered it. Nobody missed it. But I promise you, we could land on Mars tomorrow, and half of the thousand channels on my you know, satellite wouldn't cover it. And that's a shame, in a way. Well, it's not in a way. It's a shame, right? Uh, and he goes on here and he says, Media spectacles demonstrate who has power and who is powerless, who is allowed to use force and violence, and who is not, right? So, so media for Kellner is really important. 
And here are some examples, right, of, of what he's talking about. I mean, it certainly gives us an idea, for example, of beauty, be it feminine beauty or, or masculine beauty, right? It gives you an idea of, about sexuality, about how to present yourself, about your, let's say, your ethnicity, right, about masculinity, right, representations of, of how you fit into society. I mean, that's what the mafia series are about, right? It's about how you fit into society. It's about being, uh, you know, part of an Italian subculture, uh, one that's, that's, that's deeply, uh, you know, sort of uh, immersed in, in, in masculine, uh, I don't know, archetypes, let's say, right? Um, you know, again, you know, in children's programming, as we see here, right, we see representations of different races that give people an idea of, you know, of their own ethnicity, of, of what it means to, to be a, a, from a particular ethnic group, how that, you know, works into the larger culture, right? Uh, ideas of what it means to be an American, right? What, what patriotism is about, the role of the military, right? All these things are, are taught through the media in some sense or another. So with that in mind, he goes on and he talks about why he makes a case for media studies. And he says, look, in, in the culture at the time he wrote this, which was, you know, decades ago now, but still, this, this still applies. He says, you know, we're immersed from, from the time we're born to the time we die in a media-based and consumer society, right? So when you think about it, we're constantly surrounded by media. You know, I get in my car and I play the radio, or I plug in my phone, and I play, you know, podcasts. And then as I drive down the road, I see billboards that are shouting out to me. And then I put in my, uh, my ear pods for the walk to the office, and I listen to music. And then I get in my office, and I turn on my computer, and I check my news feed. And then I go to my social media. And then I teach in my class, and I use the media in the class as examples, and then I go home and I watch TV and Netflix, right? I mean, it's just, it's everywhere, and it's around us all the time. And because it's around us all the time, Kellner posits that, that media engagement is a form of cultural education, that TV is educating us. Now, it's not trying to educate us necessarily, right? It's not like the folks at Netflix want to give you a good education. Not in the sense that I'm trying to give you an education, at least. But we still learn from it, right? It tells us what to think, how to feel, what to believe, what to be afraid of, what we should want. How to be men and women, how to dress, how to, how to look, how to consume, right? What kind of stuff should we buy? How should we treat other people? It teaches us that. It teaches us how to be popular, how to be successful, how to avoid failure, and how to conform in a system of, 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 with norms and values and practices, right? I mean, there's a whole culture out there that you're born into and you have to learn the roles. And Kellner says, you know, media helps us do this. And so, because it helps us do this, gaining media literacy is an important resource, right? It, it helps us cope with a seductive culture and, and, and helps us navigate this, this media... Uh, blitz that's always coming at us and also helps us in the sense that it helps us negotiate a consumer society, one where we're just constantly being asked to buy, excuse me, more and more stuff. So from there, he, he calls on the uh, British, the Birmingham School, and he says, in recent years, cultural studies has emerged as a set of approaches to the study of culture, came out of the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. And what was so important about the, the, the Birmingham School and scholars like, like Stuart Hall is that they were really the first to study the effects of the media and other popular cultures formed on audiences. So in other words, they went to actual people and asked them, you know, what do you think of that? So this is different than media effects studies, which just looked at the media and said, okay, well, if people watch this, they're going to be violent. Here they actually went out and asked people. They showed them programs and then said, what do you think of it, right? And it seems obvious that you should ask the audience, but for whatever reason, you know, we didn't before this. And it also focused on subcultures, right? Uh, the subcultures and, and various sort of uh, audiences within the larger audience and tried to figure out, you know, how are they making sense of these programs? How are they using media culture? And, and are they using it differently, right? Um, they, they suggest that those who obey ruling dress and fashion codes produce their identities within a mainstream group, right? Uh, 
But then they're also willing to go out and say, well, there are people who identify with subcultures. And, and they were interested at the time with things like the punk culture in, in London during the 70s and early 80s, or the black nationalist subcultures. And, and these folks look and act differently from those in the mainstream. And so the, the Birmingham School wanted to see, you know, how do they create these oppositional identities? How do they engage in resistance by defining themselves against the kind of the standard models that are often portrayed in the media? So they go on here, and here there's some influence of a school called structuralism. And structuralism uh, sort of believes that uh, in order to understand any particular society or culture, you have to look at sort of the, uh, the structures that undergird that, that culture. And, and so in other words, cultures need to be studied within a larger system, right? So, so cultural studies insist that culture must be studied uh, within the social relations and system through which culture is produced and consumed. And so the study of culture, then, is intimately bound up with the study of society, politics, and economics, right? So, I mean, it's one thing to look at a, look at a book or a movie and try and analyze it just on its own. But what they're saying is, and what the structuralists would say, is that we need to look at it in, through a, a wider lens. And, and that if we, just, if we just look at the movie, it'll only tell us so much. But if we look at the movie in terms of context, right, the society that makes it, the politics of that society, the economics behind it, we can learn more from that movie or book or radio program or website or whatever it is that, that you're studying. Now, there's also an influence from this ideological criticism in that cultural study shows how media culture articulates the dominant values and ideologies and social developments of the era. And it thinks of U.S. culture in particular as a kind of contested terrain with various subgroups and ideologies struggling for dominance, right? I mean, Kellner understood that the U.S. is a messy place with all kinds of different groups and ethnicities and uh, religious groups and, and so on, right? And that they're all kind of constantly engaged in this ongoing struggle for dominance. You know, one group is always trying to sort of get over on the next. There's Democrats, there are Republicans, there are Catholics, there are Protestants, right? There, there are all these different groups. And they're all vying for power to a certain extent, right? And so, you know, the, the cultural picture of the United States has always been one that of struggle to a certain extent. Uh, one that always sort of takes place on what he calls contested terrain. Now, he's also interested in the ways that cultural study uh, subverts distinctions between high and low culture. He says that it, it does this by refusing to erect any specific cultural hierarchies or canons. So what he's, you know, if you were in school 40 years ago, you would only study the canon which are selected works that are picked out by people with PhDs, uh, and they say these are the most important works, you know, and these are the works that are worthy of study. But in contemporary cultural studies, we open uh, sort of our minds to studying uh, things that traditionally would have been associated with low culture. Um, so Beethoven is high culture, Ice Spice is low culture. Um, you know, Shakespeare is, is high culture, um, uh, keeping up with the Kardashians is low culture, you see, right? But cultural studies is open to the analysis of any of these. And the reason why is because culture is made up of high and low culture, right? And all these things are culturally significant in some way. So this sort of avoids the old kind of elitist, you know, oh, well, we only study Shakespeare or only the classics, you know. We, we kind of open things up because we realize that, that all these things have cultural value and we don't want to be elitist, right? And so generally we try not to cut the field of culture into high and low or popular and elite culture. And the argument is that these distinctions are in one sense difficult to maintain, um, Shakespeare, for example, in his time wasn't really high culture, but became high culture over time, right? So, so these values can change. And then uh, there's also this idea that by saying that something is, is high culture, it could be a front for uh, 
uh, normative aesthetic valuations and a political program. So I could say, well, this is high culture and this is low culture. And I could say those things in a way that forwards my political interests. Um, whether you buy that argument or not, you know, that's, that's up to you. Um, I agree with the first part. I'm not so sure about the second part, uh, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, so as a result, what we want to do is we want to study the whole range of culture, right? Without prejudice towards uh, one or another cultural text, institution, or practice. And by doing this, this opens the, the door to a more differentiated political valuation of cultural artifacts. Um, so it's one that's not just based on aesthetics, you know, it's not one that's just based on how pretty a movie is or how it's put together or, you know, the technical proficiency of an editor. It's one that's based more in cultural uh, and political valuations. Um, yeah, so from there, again, there is this influence from the Frankfurt School. Um, Ideology is still of central importance because dominant ideologies reproduce social relations of domination and subordination. So we're still worried about ideology. We haven't thrown that away. And we understand that contemporary societies are made up of opposing groups. Again, this goes back to the U.S. being contested terrain. So cultural studies then specifies what, if any, ideologies are working in cultural artifacts. Right. So, so we still do cultural critique. It's just that's not all we do. Right, we try and do, try and do more, and from there, this is where uh, Kellner wants to bring in multiculturalism, and this is one of the early arguments for multiculturalism. This is uh, this was a big thing back like in the eighties and nineties uh, in education, uh, and the whole idea behind multiculturalism is that that uh, well, as it says here, multiculturalism affirms the worth of different types of culture and cultural groups, right. Uh, and, and he goes on, he makes all these points, right? And he's interested in studying multiculturalism because it can show us how to resist the dominant and coded meanings that are in texts. It can empower people who have been marginalized, um, and so on, right? Uh, so he's making a big argument here for, for including the study of various cultures, not just Western culture. And so after all this, he comes up with this idea that, that cultural studies is overall a three, three-pronged or three-fold project. One that A, discusses production and political economy of cultural artifacts. When I say cultural artifacts, I mean things like movies, books, stuff like that. Uh, B, it engages in textual analysis. So we will you know, watch a movie and break down the scenes or read a book and read it closely and analyze it, right? But then we'll also study, see how people use and, and how audiences actually make sense of or the reception of cultural texts, right? So you see what we're doing here is, you know, the way they're, they're answering the question, like how do we fix the problems of what came before? They're answering by saying, well, we're going to talk about how they're made, the context in which these cultural products are made. We're still going to look at, at the product like, like Adorno and Horkheimer did. We're still going to look at the, the movies closely or the text co closely. But then we're also going to go out and ask people in the world from these different cultures and subcultures, how do you make sense of this? Right? And the idea is that with this kind of holistic approach, that you get a better understanding or a deeper understanding of culture by analyzing things this way. So here are the, here are the different phases broken down. So you remember the first part is we studied the production or what's called the political economy of a piece. And political economy is all about um, sort of who pays for what, who owns uh, you know, uh, the media, what effect does, does money have on the messages that you're seeing come out of the media. Um, and the argument is, of course, that this is more comprehensive than just studying the, the actual media artifact itself. And the reason why is because the system of production, for example, television production, determines what sort of programs you're going to get, what kind of artifacts are going to be produced, and what limits there will be as to what can and cannot be said and shown, and what sort of audience effects the text can generate. So with broadcast TV, for example, a, t a TV program on broadcast TV is traditionally either a half an hour long or an hour long. It's going to have commercial breaks built in. 
If it's a drama, you're, the writer is going to keep the commercial breaks in mind. He's going to try and hook you in the first 15 minutes of the show, right, or five minutes of the show. Then you're going to get a commercial. Then you're going to come back, and they're going to try and keep you going through the other commercial breaks, right? It's going to have a budget in terms of how much can be spent on it. It's probably going to be shot, uh, if it's a comedy, for example, uh, using a three-camera system because that's the, the, the most efficient way to do it. Um, you know, and all these things affect how the product looks. Uh, you know, you can't use, you can't say fuck on broadcast TV, right? So it's going to affect what can be said, what can't be said. And if I'm uh, making the news, it's going to be a half hour long. If it's local news, it's going to be a half hour long show. And I'm probably not going to say anything bad about the uh, people who own the, the, the news channel, right? All these things play into to the kind of media that we consume. And, and this is what, uh, you know, the study of production and political economy help us understand, right? It helps us understand why TV shows are formatted the way they are, why we have the kind of genres that we have in movies and television, and the limits and range of ideologies. And this all has to do with things like globalization, the consolidation of, of uh, you know, the media industries, of cultural resistance. All these things figure into political economy, and this is what political economists study. From there, you know, we, of course, also do textual analysis. And this is when we, you know, this is, for example, if you get a movie and you watch it very closely to figure out what kind of ideological messages it has, uh, how the story works, what kind, of, what kind of narrative strategies it employs, what kind of images it constructs, right, what kind of effects these images might have on the audience, right? And the way that we do this is we combine uh, sort of a formal, close reading of how it's put together, along with what's called semiotic analysis, or an analysis of the way that it looks and the signs and the codes that they use to put these things together. Now, we also acknowledge, though, that when we read these texts, we can only read it with the knowledge that we have ourselves. And somebody else might read it and come up with a different idea, right? Like, I might watch Star Wars and take away one message, but you might watch it and take away another. And that has to do with where we're born, who our parents are, who we hang out with, you know, all, the color of our skin, how much money we have, you know, all these things figure in, right? So, we're, we're, we acknowledge the fact that there could be a bunch of different readings, that, that two different people could watch the same message but come away with different meanings. And so, then, because of this, we also have to go out and look at how the audience makes sense of the text. And this is where we go out and say, okay, you just watched Star Wars, tell me what you thought of it. What kind of messages did you get out of it, right? And when we go and we talk to groups of people, this is called ethnographic research, right? This is the kind of research that uh, people like Janice Radway have done. And so, you know, we're acknowledging by doing this that media culture provides the materials for individuals to create identities and, and meanings. And we're asking them, you know, what do you think of this piece of media? How does this work? Like, does this help you craft who you are, right? Make sense of the world, all this kind of thing, right? Um, and so the idea is that by asking people and asking them how they make sense of these things, this helps us overcome sort of the one-sided nature of just textual analysis alone, right? And it also focuses attention on the actual political effects that texts have. Now, there are some problems, though, with audience studies. You know, class as a function, you know, how much money you have, where you fit in the social hierarchy, this is often downplayed, particularly in the United States. Now, in places like Great Britain, class can be exaggerated at the expense of other factors. So maybe, you know, in, in England, because of the feudal system, they're still very interested in your social position, your social class. And so they might look at that more than they look at other important things, like gender or ethnicity or your sexual orientation, right? Uh, and sometimes we, we sort of romanticize the idea that the audience... Uh, can interpret it any way they want. So sometimes we overlook the fact that there are very clear uh, messages coming out of some of these texts. Now, that's what I mean by romanticizing active audience. And, and then finally, of course, in this field, there is a tendency to celebrate resistance uh, just for resistance's sake. You know, um, you know, we, we tend to celebrate the marginalized and those on the uh, fringes of society just because they're on the fringes. Uh, there is very much kind of anti-establishment uh, motivation behind much of this, and I, I'll freely admit that. Uh, you know, whether you think this is good or bad is up to you, but it works for the anti, 
establishment types, certainly. So then he concludes, and I'm not going to read you all this, but he concludes by saying, listen, cultural studies needs to be made up of a bunch of perspectives, right? And that one of the problem with the theories in the past is that they've been reductionist. They've oversimplified things. But by looking at production, by looking at the text itself, and then by looking at how people make sense of, of these texts, this will give us, you know, really a better picture of what's going on. And then if we incorporate, you know, a multicultural approach, then we get an even, you know, sort of wider view of what's happening. And so he concludes, and he says, in short, cultural studies, uh, you know, provides comprehensive approaches to culture that can be applied to a wide variety of artifacts. It's, it gives us a really comprehensive perspective. You know, when we use uh, study of production, political economy, textual analysis, and audience research, right, it can really give us insight into political perspectives that enable people to dissect the meanings, messages, and effects of the dominant cultural forms. And then he, he concludes, and he says it's really empowering for people. You know, this kind of thing could be called media literacy, and it empowers people to gain uh, power over their, their culture. And if they want to, then struggle for alternative cultures and political change. And that's the value that, that Kellner sees in all this. And then at the conclusion of all this, you know, here you see an expanded model of the uh, sort of the production, circulation, reception, and feedback model that Stuart Hall made. And it's expanded upon and it's made into this thing we call the circuit of culture. And this is still, this diagram is used today throughout cultural studies. And the idea is that if you're doing a cultural studies kind of examination, you can start at any point on this. You know, you can look at how something's made and then see how that influences how people consume it. And then look at how regulation influences things like representation and how this affects identity, right? But you'll see that all these things also connect to each other in every facet. So, you know, how something is produced is impacted by how it's regulated, right? Like you can't say fuck on TV, you know, that, that impacts how it's produced. And this in turn affects how it's consumed, which in turn affects people's identities, you see? And so all these things are interrelated. They're in a circle, but each point in the circle, it can be connected to any other point on the circle because they all influence one another. And that's why it's a circuit. And so that's sort of the, the, the idea, right, behind these five cultural processes or the five points on his circuit. Okay, so that does it for this lecture. Thank you for for staying patient with me and checking this out. And hopefully you have a, a fairly decent idea of, of where cultural studies is at today. And, and we'll sort of use this model uh, moving forward now uh, as, we, as we go on uh, through the rest of the semester. All right. Thanks again.